Hello there and welcome back. This is day number 199 and it's my joy to read to you 2 Kings 24 and 25, Psalm 135, and our second reading in John 16. The word that we read today holds examples to follow, examples not to follow, and clues about how to come closer to Almighty God. Let's open to 2 Kings 24. In yesterday's reading, we heard of Josiah's reform, leading the people to renew the covenant with God. That chapter had this telling comment about the Passover. There had not been a Passover celebration like that since the time when the judges ruled in Israel, nor throughout all the years of the kings of Israel and Judah. Many times I think people make the naive assumption that the people of Israel customarily performed all sorts of difficult commands in the law, like the one about the year of Jubilee. In my opinion, no way. 2 Kings 24 While Jehoiakim was king, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylonia invaded Judah, and for three years Jehoiakim was forced to submit to his rule, then he rebelled. The Lord sent armed bands of Babylonians, Syrians, Moabites, and Ammonites against Jehoiakim to destroy Judah, as the Lord had said through his servants the prophets that he would do. This happened at the Lord's command, in order to banish the people of Judah from his sight because of all the sins that King Manasseh had committed, and especially because of all the innocent people he had killed. The Lord could not forgive Manasseh for that. Everything that Jehoiakim did is recorded in the history of the kings of Judah. Jehoiakim died, and his son Jehoiakim succeeded him as king. The king of Egypt and his army never marched out of Egypt again because the king of Babylonia now controlled all the territory that had belonged to Egypt, from the Euphrates River to the northern border of Egypt. Jehoiakim was eighteen years old when he became king of Judah, and he ruled in Jerusalem for three months. His mother was Nehushta, the daughter of Elnathan from Jerusalem. Following the example of his father, Jehoiakim sinned against the Lord. It was during his reign that the Babylonian army, commanded by King Nebuchadnezzar's officers, marched against Jerusalem and besieged it. During the siege, Nebuchadnezzar himself came to Jerusalem, and King Jehoiakim, along with his mother, his sons, his officers, and the palace officials, surrendered to the Babylonians. In the eighth year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, he took Jehoiakim prisoner and carried off to Babylon all the treasures in the temple and the palace. As the Lord had foretold, Nebuchadnezzar broke up all the gold utensils which King Solomon had made for use in the temple. Nebuchadnezzar carried away as prisoners the people of Jerusalem, all the royal princes and all the leading men, ten thousand in all. He also deported all the skilled workers, including the blacksmiths, leaving only the poorest of the people behind in Judah. Nebuchadnezzar took Jehoiakim to Babylon as prisoner, together with Jehoiakim's mother, his wives, his officials, and the leading men of Judah. Nebuchadnezzar deported all the important men to Babylonia, seven thousand in all and one thousand skilled workers, including the blacksmiths, all of them able-bodied men fit for military duty. Nebuchadnezzar made Jehoiakim's uncle, Matania, king of Judah, and changed his name to Zedekiah. Zedekiah was twenty-one years old when he became king of Judah, and he ruled in Jerusalem for eleven years. His mother was Hamutal, the daughter of Jeremiah from the city of Libna. 
King Zedekiah sinned against the Lord, just as King Jehoiakim had done. The Lord became so angry with the people of Jerusalem and Judah that he banished them from his sight. 2 Kings 25 Zedekiah rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylonia, and so Nebuchadnezzar came with all his army and attacked Jerusalem on the tenth day of the tenth month of the ninth year of Zedekiah's reign. They set up camp outside the city, built siege walls around it, and kept it under siege until Zedekiah's eleventh year. On the ninth day of the fourth month of that same year, when the famine was so bad that the people had nothing left to eat, the city walls were broken through. Although the Babylonians were surrounding the city, all the soldiers escaped during the night. They left by way of the royal garden, went through the gateway connecting the two walls, and fled in the direction of the Jordan Valley. But the Babylonian army pursued King Zedekiah, captured him in the plains near Jericho, and all his soldiers deserted him. Zedekiah was taken to King Nebuchadnezzar, who was in the city of Ribla, and there Nebuchadnezzar passed sentence on him. While Zedekiah was looking on, his sons were put to death. Then Nebuchadnezzar had Zedekiah's eyes put out, placed him in chains, and took him to Babylon. On the seventh day of the fifth month of the nineteenth year of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylonia, Nebuzaradan, advisor to the king and commander of his army, entered Jerusalem. He burned down the temple, the palace, and the houses of all the important people in Jerusalem, and his soldiers tore down the city walls. Then Nebuzaradan took away to Babylonia the people who were left in the city, the remaining skilled workers, and those who had deserted to the Babylonians. But he left in Judah some of the poorest people who owned no property, and put them to work in the vineyards and fields. The Babylonians broke in pieces the bronze columns and the carts that were in the temple, together with the large bronze tank, and they took all the bronze to Babylon. They also took away the shovels and the ash containers used in cleaning the altar, the tools used in tending the lamps, the bowls used for catching the blood from the sacrifices, the bowls used for burning incense, and all the other bronze articles used in the temple service. They took away everything that was made of gold or silver, including the small bowls and the pans used for carrying live coals. The bronze objects that King Solomon had made for the temple, the two columns, the carts, and the large tank were too heavy to weigh. The two columns were identical. Each one was twenty-seven feet high, with a bronze capital on top, four and a half feet high. All around each capital was a bronze grillwork decorated with pomegranates made of bronze. In addition, Nebuzaradan, the commanding officer, took away as prisoners Saraya, the high priest, Zephaniah, the priest next in rank, and the three other important temple officials. From the city he took the officer who had been in command of the troops, five of the king's personal advisers who were still in the city, the commander's assistant who was in charge of military records, and sixty other important men. Nebuzaradan took them to the king of Babylonia, who was in the city of Ribla, in the territory of Hamath. There the king had them beaten and put to death. So the people of Judah were carried away from their land into exile. King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylonia made Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam and grandson of Shaphan, governor of Judah, and placed him in charge of all those who had not been taken away to Babylonia. When the Judean officers and soldiers who had not surrendered heard about this, they joined Gedaliah in Mizpah. These officers were Ishmael, son of Nethaniah, 
Johanan son of Karea, Seraya son of Tamhumeth from the town of Netopha, and Jezaniah from Maaka. Gedaliah said to them, I give you my word that there is no need for you to be afraid of the Babylonian officials. Settle in this land, serve the king of Babylonia, and all will go well with you. But in the seventh month of that year, Ishmael, the son of Nathaniah and grandson of Elishama, a member of the royal family, went to Mizpah with ten men, attacked Gedaliah, and killed him. They also killed the Israelites and Babylonians who were there with him. Then all the Israelites, rich and poor alike, together with the army officers, left and went to Egypt, because they were afraid of the Babylonians. In the year that Avil Merodach became king of Babylonia, he showed kindness to King Jehoiakim of Judah by releasing him from prison. This happened on the twenty-seventh day of the twelfth month of the thirty-seventh year after Jehoiakim had been taken away as prisoner. Avil Merodach treated him kindly and gave him a position of greater honor than he gave the other kings who were exiles with him in Babylonia. So Jehoiakim was permitted to change from his prison clothes and to dine at the king's table for the rest of his life. Each day, for as long as he lived, he was given a regular allowance for his needs. And now, let's open to Psalm 135. Olson's book gives the title for the chapter on this psalm as What Kind of God Do You Have? That's a great question to ask to introduce this psalm. Psalm 135 Praise the Lord! Praise Him, you servants of the Lord, who stand in the Lord's house, in the temple of our God. Praise the Lord, because He is good. Sing praises to Him, because He is kind. He chose Jacob for Himself, the people of Israel for His own. I know that our Lord is great, greater than all the gods. He does whatever He wishes, in heaven and on earth, in the seas and in the depths below. He brings storm clouds from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the storms, and He brings out the wind from His storeroom. In Egypt, He killed all the firstborn of people and animals alike. There he performed miracles and wonders to punish the king and all his officials. He destroyed many nations and killed powerful kings, Sihon, king of the Amorites, Og, king of Bashan, and all the kings in Canaan. He gave their lands to his people. He gave them to Israel. Lord, you will always be proclaimed as God. All generations will remember you. You, O oh Lord, will defend your people. You will take pity on your servants. The gods of the nations are made of silver and gold. They are formed by human hands. They have mouths but cannot speak, and eyes but cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear. They are not even able to breathe. May all who made them and who trust in them become like the idols they have made. Praise the Lord, O people of Israel. Praise Him, you priests of God. Praise the Lord, you Levites. Praise Him, all you that worship Him. Praise the Lord in Zion, in Jerusalem, His home. Praise the Lord. Let's return to John 16. At the end of chapter 14, Jesus mentioned leaving that place, 
the upper room. But Jesus' teaching in chapters 15 through 16 fits so well with chapter 14 that they may have taken place in the upper room. This chapter includes more important teaching about the Holy Spirit, our Advocate and Helper, and important key concepts about prayer. John chapter 16, starting at verse 12. I have much more to tell you, but now it would be too much for you to bear. When, however, the Spirit comes, who reveals the truth about God, He will lead you into the full truth. He will not speak on His own authority, but He will speak of what He hears and will tell you of things to come. He will give me glory, because He will take what I say and tell it to you. All that my Father has is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will take what I give Him and tell it to you. In a little while you will not see me anymore, and then a little while later you will see me. Some of the disciples asked among themselves, What does this mean? He tells us that in a little while we will not see Him, and then a little while later we will see Him. And he also says, It is because I am going to the Father. What does this little while mean? We don't know what he's talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to question him, so he said to them, I said, In a little while you will not see me, and then a little while later you will see me. Is this what you are asking about among yourselves? I am telling you the truth. You will cry and weep, but the world will be glad. You will be sad, but your sadness will turn into gladness. When a woman is about to give birth, she is sad because her hour of suffering has come. But when the baby is born, she forgets her suffering because she is happy that a baby has been born into the world. That is how it is with you. Now you are sad. But I will see you again, and your hearts will be filled with gladness, the kind of gladness that no one can take away from you. When that day comes, you will not ask me for anything. I am telling you the truth. The Father will give you whatever you ask of Him for the sake of my glory. Until now you have not asked for anything to glorify me. Ask, and you will receive, so that your happiness may be complete. I have used figures of speech to tell you these things, but the time will come when I will not use figures of speech, but will speak to you plainly about the Father. When that day comes, you will begin to ask the Father directly for things that glorify me. You won't need me to ask him on your behalf. For the Father loves you. He loves you because you love me and have believed that I came from God. I did come from the Father, and I came into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. Then his disciples said to him, Now you're speaking plainly without using figures of speech. We know now that you know everything. You do not need to have someone ask you questions. This makes us believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, Do you believe now? The time is coming and is already here when all of you will be scattered, each of you to your own home, and I will be left all alone. But I'm not really alone, because the Father is with me. I have told all these things to you who are joined as one with me, so that you will have peace. The world will make you suffer, but be brave. I have defeated the world. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, 
We thank you that now we understand the figures of speech that the disciples had difficulty understanding. Help us to think past the surface and go deeper, because the things you revealed hold deeper meaning for us today. Our Heavenly Father, you are the sovereign God who deserves our highest praise. You do whatever you wish in heaven and in every part of the earth. Lord, rise up and make all the world see that you are not represented by any idol or statue made by human hands. And you have complete victory over all the demons represented by the idols. We trust in you, Lord, as the psalmist said, that you will defend your people and take pity on your servants. O oh, Spirit of God, please continue to lead us into the full truth. In your mission to glorify Jesus, prepare us fully to be his representatives in this world. Help us to realize heavenly peace here on earth, because we are united and one with Jesus. And help us now as we pray for all sorts of things that will bring glory to him.